take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to cover a lot of verses today. And as you're turning there, I just want to give you uh, two quick little things before I forget. Vonnie's, uh, Vonnie's memorial service is coming up on Saturday. So Friday evening will be, be some calling hours and then a prayer service. Uh, the prayer service will start at 6.30, and the calling hours are anywhere from, you know, from 4 to four to 6.30, and then it'll end at 7. Uh, and then Saturday, the service will be at 11 o'clock, so that's coming up this weekend. I encourage you all to come and just, just remember, share with the family to uh, praise the Lord that Vonnie is not in the grave. She's alive with Jesus Christ. Uh, but I also want to tell you, just give you a little update, because I know some of you asked about my wife, and she is, uh, she's had a little setback. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she slipped on the steps, smacked her head, gave herself a very large concussion. Um, so as she was doing pretty well until yesterday, and then she had a little setback, and then today, I have yet to know. But <laughs> just, just keep praying for her, and uh, that all the symptoms kind of go, and she can start just operating as normal as it goes. But So in Acts chapter 2, for today's service, we're going to be looking at prayer and how prayer is essential for the spiritual growth of the church. And really this is part one, and part one is, is more of the, the backstory to this, of why this comes to be. So we're going to start off in verse 42, and then go back a little bit to verse 14 and work our way through as we go. But I want to start off with this, and we'll remind you and give you this great reminder. Right? Number one, that God is in control. God is in control. No matter what happens in our country, it's great to know that God is in control. No matter what happens in the world, it is great to know that God has already given us his word and he's going to tell us what happens in the end and he tells us what's going on right now because his word is ever true and still, God is in control. And we have to remember to not become so discouraged about the things that go on around us that we forget where our hope is found. And I say this because we are called to be a faithful people, right? A people faithful to Jesus Christ in every single aspect of our lives. And, and as we know, we can't do this on our own. And praise the Lord that he is so good at helping us in that fashion, day in and day out. And when it comes to this, we're going we're gonna to see the beginning of the church. We see how they gather together here. We're going to see that imperfect people were used mightily by God as he makes them perfect in a, through, the, through the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's, the, here, here's some of the truth. I wanna, and I want to kind of give you this. Right? Here's the, the open confession truth. And this is uh, a friend of mine told me this one day, and I'm stealing his words because they are fully accurate. Without question, I'm a deeply flawed man, a deeply flawed husband, father, and pastor. But the greatest concern of mine is not the flaws, it is are we faithful to the book? Are we faithful to the word of God? Am I faithful in sharing the message of Jesus Christ? Because here's what happens. Right, through it, ever since, I can give you the, the exact time here, which is a rarity. Ever since my junior year of English class, I have been accused of being unloving which has partially been accurate in some circumstances, <laughs> but I've been accused of being unloving because of the Word of God. And here is the, here is the, uh, the, the response that always comes. Well, you upset people with the Word of God. I didn't know how to handle that when I was younger. Now I just kind of chuckle and think, good. Right? You need to be upset with the word of God because it needs to work within, within you. It confronts the sin in our life, and that's the whole point. But when it comes to loving people, if we don't love them with the word of God, are we actually loving people as God has asked us to do? And the answer is no. So this is where we are when it comes to the beginning of the church. And this is the, what I need you to remember even before we go back to the beginning of chapter 2. But let's look at 42. Acts chapter 2 and 42. And this is what it says. They continued steadfastly 
in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. So there's one thing I want to remind you of as we are about to dissect this, and it's Romans 10. It's what we talked about last week. It is so faith comes by hearing, and the hearing by the word of God. We are faithful. We are charged as Christians. Whether you are a pastor, a missionary, or just a lay worker, or the average attender, it does not matter. We are charged by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is the beginning of the church. Right, amazingly, beginning of the church, where did they meet? Anywhere they could. Most specifically, in the, the courtyard of the temple, they were out in the open. It was the largest place, the public area. They were able to gather. It was supposed to be the, the area where they taught and they preached the word of God. So what did they do? They did four main things, and we're going to take a look at those briefly. And the first is they, they taught the apostles' doctrine. And we think that this might be something different uh, than nowadays, but it really isn't. It's the proclamation and the teaching of the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and more importantly, it's meeting for man's salvation. That's what they taught. They stood out in the open and they publicly proclaimed who Jesus Christ was unashamedly. And they gathered in fellowship. And really, really, fellowship is the idea that is to share in the lives of other believers. Very simply put, we are sharing in the lives of one another to find delight in one another. Are you delighted with everybody in church? <laughs> I guess we'll get to the prayer spot faster than uh, I was anticipating, but, <laughs> but that's the whole point. We're delighting in one another in our relationship in the Lord, right? We're called to encourage and to stimulate each other for our growth in righteousness, in Jesus Christ. See, the, the whole idea of fellowship is to be like-minded of Christ toward one another, right? Having the mind of Christ with one another. In Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, Paul gives us this very simple definition. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, and distributing to the needs of saints given to hospitality. You cannot do all of that on your own. By doing it together, we build like-mindedness. We build a body who cares for one another and who cares for the needs of of our community and those who are truly lost and hurting. And then there's the, 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 the third aspect that goes, and that is the breaking, of bed, the breaking of bread. It's the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And when we do this, it is the act of remembrance and thankfulness and dedication to Jesus Christ together. doesn't mean we can't, and sometimes a need to, to have communion uh, as individuals, but usually this is done together. Why? Because we are a body praising our risen Lord and Savior. But then he says prayer. And prayer here is not because it comes last in this scenario, but it is for the fact that it, it attributes and really makes all the rest of these things grow. And prayer, when it talks about this, everybody is always called to individually pray, but this is really corporate prayer. It is the uniting together for one common cause. It is the spreading and witnessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In prayer at this time, in the beginning of the church, and by the way, it has not changed until now, even though it has been attempted to be done. This is not only viewed, right? Prayer is not only viewed as an essential part of spiritual growth of the church, but each believer was trained in the discipline of prayer. Where do you think we failed as a church? We have failed for the many, many years, and I'm speaking of church in general, over the whole of our biblical history, is because we forgot the importance of prayer as a body. We forgot that the underground church has grown vastly, number one, because they are unashamed of Jesus Christ, but number two, because they prayed mightily wherever they could meet, and God worked See, praying together is necessary for greater fellowship and unity amongst believers. It really creates less problems. I, I challenge you. Take the person that you don't like the most. 
I'm sure you know who it is, or that you struggle with the most. And you pray for them daily for 30 days, and you tell me if your heart is not sensitive and soft toward them. If it is yet to soften, I will tell you, you're probably praying for their judgment instead of their salvation. <clears throat> Which sometimes flows in there. You just got to fight it off. Right? <laughs> but before we dive into the greater aspects of this prayer, and that's part two that I want to get at, I want us to look at these four aspects and why it became so important. And it all started in the previous verses of chapter two, right? In order for the church to be as powerful as it was at that time in history, saving thousands upon thousands and having them gathered together, there was something major that happened first, and it started with one man willing to share the gospel. But in order for the church to begin, in order for the church to grow, and the same thing is still for today, in order for people to be added to God's church, what do they need to hear first? They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. And Peter gives his first sermon. If you look at verse 14, he says, But Peter, standing in the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. In the previous 13 verses, the Holy Spirit came upon the church. It came upon the believers. And they were allowed to speak to people in their language, right? People heard the gospel in their original language, and they were marveled. And was, there were some that accused the disciples of being drunk with wine. Now, I want you to think about this practically. I have never met a drunk person who got more eloquent, <laughs> who could clearly define the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never in my day have I met somebody, and I have known many, sadly. I have known many. So when it comes to this, Peter starts off with saying, listen. Now, you got to remember, he's standing up with his own people who do not agree with Jesus Christ, who have disagreed with the disciples, who have brought much hate. To these are the individuals who called for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he stands up and he says, let me tell you some truth. And this is where Peter starts. And this is what I absolutely love. He starts with the prophet Joel. Right? He doesn't start with, let me tickle your ears, let me speak to you the truth, let me do something with you that makes you try to help you believe what I have to say. He starts with the word of God. And this is what he says from Joel chapter 2. He says, it shall come to pass in these last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall, see, or shall dream dreams, and my my men servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He goes right to the truth. Why are you marveling? You who are supposed to know the word of God, let me remind you that God promised the gift of his Holy Spirit, and now that gift is here. And it is because of that these people are speaking the truth. Now this is the, the, the wonderful thing when it comes to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you share the word of God, people can argue with it all day long, and I have yet to hear any good responses to it other than, well, Jesus, he was just a man. Well, the Bible, it can't be true. It was written 2,000 years ago, but nobody's ever proven it wrong, nor will they ever, by the way. But he starts off with this very simple thing. The Spirit is here. And what you need to know is that it gives us several different descriptions in this, and he focuses on the Holy Spirit, but he says the coming of the Holy Spirit is here. The judgment that is going to come for your rebellion and disobedience is going to be poured out on the earth after this, and though the Lord will return to establish his kingdom here on the earth. Right? He is going to set foot on the earth. But 
For now, the giving of the Holy Spirit is his final act of salvation. So this is the great thing. Peter takes everything to the gospel because the Spirit convicts the hearts of men and women with the truth of God. It is Jesus who provided the salvation, who has given salvation, but it is the Holy Spirit who convicts our hearts in order for us to respond to the gospel. Because it says very clearly in verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Up until that point where Jesus takes his church home to be with him. You have until then, and we don't know when that time is. We do not know when our individual lives will come to an end here on this earth, even though our soul is going to reign with Jesus for eternity. But it says to call out in the name of the Lord, to be saved from judgment, to be restored to the Father, to be forgiven of their sins, to be a people of righteousness, to be God's people once again and forevermore. But if you notice in these first few verses, he does not say who the Lord God is. He just points out, here's what scripture has to say. Let me address your accusation first. And the accusation is, my people are drunk. Let's get that. Here it is. Your word prophesied. Here's the truth. Now that I've answered that, let me tell you how you are saved. And that's verses 21 through 23, right? If you look at 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he goes back to his, his uh, speech. And he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Now here's the great thing. I want you to understand this too. When you boldly proclaim the word of God, people will stop and listen. It is the power of God that they are reacting to. Not you, not your words, not your presentation, but when God says, stand up and speak, people will listen to what is said. And that is what is happening with Peter. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. So he answers the question right away. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. The Lord is Jesus. He doesn't let him think about this for very long. This is the same Jesus who performed miracles, who healed people. He performed wonders that they were, they were, they were simply amazed. Since the age of 12, they were amazed at the teachings of Jesus Christ and what he could do. He performed signs to prove who he is it's more specifically that he is able to forgive sins. He is God working in their midst. See, they knew this very well. They've already seen him. They've already yelled at him. They've already crucified him. But the important part here, the greater part that goes with this, that it was God the Father who delivered his son as the provision for the judgment of sin. It was already ordained. It was already the foreknowledge of God. It didn't come after the fact. And this is what we need to remember of God. God doesn't decide later, oh, by the way, my people are lost. I think I'm going to go save them now. It was already planned. If it wasn't already planned, then he wouldn't have all knowledge, and he wouldn't be all-knowing, and then he wouldn't be all-powerful in order to be able to do it. See, it was God the Father who delivered his son, but do not forget it was our sin that made his death necessary. See, it was God's preordained plan for Jesus to die an atoning death. I don't know about you, but I do not know where I would be if I wasn't for the sovereignty of God. If it wasn't for Jesus walking the road to Golgotha. There is no possible way that either you or I could take in half the beating that Jesus took. There is no possible way that we could be alive, we would still be in the grave. This is our God. And it is because God sent his son. See, if you flip with me back to Isaiah 52, keep your finger in Acts 2, we will be back there. Isaiah 52, and then we'll be in 53 briefly. There's a description here that stands out very, very large. And starting at verse 13, just 13 and 14. 
end of the chapter, 52. It says, Behold, my servant, capitalized, that's Jesus Christ, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Right? First, we have to understand that Jesus is going to be exalted. He was already exalted. He came in a lowly form and will be exalted yet again. In Philippians chapter 2, let me read this description to you. Because it gives, it's very well known, but it gives a, one of the greatest descriptions of the exaltation of Jesus Christ given to him by the Father. When he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus will be exalted for he is our Savior, he is our Lord, he is our King, he is our answer to our sin problem, he is the answer for the entire world. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that even makes us worthy. He shall be exalted. But in order for him to be exalted by the plan of God, we get verse 14. It is one of the most difficult verses to read. Because it says, Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. He took a beating that dis figured him. It was such a description, such a description that he no longer looked human is what it is being described as. I have sat in hospital rooms with people who have lost their features of who they are, and it's very difficult to tell that they are the same person. And that was just because a disease ate away their body. Now you multiply that by a thousand and you think his flesh was ripped off of him. He was whipped. A crown of thorns is on him. Blood is flowing more than anything else. And yet, he is going to be exalted. I want you to think about this personally. That is the road that was meant for you and I. It is the road that was meant for you and I because that is what the judgment of sin demands. But then we have Isaiah 53. We have the description of Jesus Christ. It is one of the greatest prophetic descriptions that has been given. And it still holds true. Who has believed our report? Is that not the same question today? Will you not listen to the truth about Jesus Christ? When will you believe me? When will you believe God and his word? Right? It says, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He came in the form of a man that did not attract right away. In other words, His glory was not fully displayed that was magnetic. We know he was fully God. We know he was fully man. But he was representing mankind in this aspect. Why? Because he was a lamb to the slaughter. He is not yet introduced as the king. Since he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed." 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you are not a thankful Christian, then you have forgotten your Lord and Savior. I hope that is not true of you today. I hope that you can look and see the road that you were meant to walk and God sent him in your place. I hope that you can see that you were a lost sheep and you heard the voice of Jesus Christ calling you back home. I hope that you can see that it was by his stripes, his wounds, that he shed his blood on that cross that you and I are healed and we are able to be forgiven for our sins. See, he goes on and he says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You know how difficult it is not to speak when you're getting smacked around? <clears throat> I've got about a 3% success ratio. Okay? <laughs> and yet it was, when you read the story of Pontius Pilate, he kept his mouth shut and only answered very specific questions so he would fulfill Scripture and fulfill his mission. He said he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, and this is absolutely humbling, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. I want you to remember this very same thing right here. You are not entitled to the love of God. God gave it to you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. God sent his son so that you could be counted worthy because he chose to do so. Because it pleased the father to send his son to save your soul. And as a result of that, he says, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied, and by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He is our mediator. He is at the right hand of God. He is declaring that we are his children. It says, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This was our God, planned by the Father, fulfilled by the Son, so that you and I are not lost and dead in our sin. We are not bound to the grave. That is God's foreordained Plan, and it was revealed from Isaiah 53, and it was being spoken to the people yet again in Acts chapter 2. Flip back with me to Acts chapter 2. I think it's sometimes necessary to remember what Jesus went through so we don't lighten the cost of what was paid. In verses 23 and 24, at the end of 23 and 23b, here's where the indictment comes in. Now, as, as a speaker, <clears throat> I will tell you part of this is my favorite part. You were wrong! <laughs> but this is what he says. He said very clearly, because he's speaking with the power of God about who Jesus Christ is, it is you who have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it, it was you who sent God's Son to the cross. It was you who killed the Christ. But it is important to remember that, that part of part A when it says it was God's plan all along. But it is blood. His blood is on your hands by doing so. Right? It is you who killed Jesus Christ. It is because of your evil intent in actions. However, and this is the great part that comes with this in verse 24. However, death 
could not hold him. The grave could not hold the Lord God, the King of kings, the Messiah, the Christ. For it is the power of God, the purpose of God, and the promise of God that cannot be stopped or limited by evil actions. That, in a nutshell, should get you all excited. Because no matter what happens in our world today, the same thing is very true. No matter what evil intent or evil actions by any man or any woman or any child that is against God, it cannot stop his power, his purpose, and promise that he has already made. See, it was Jesus, as Peter is saying, that he rose from the grave. It was Jesus who defeated death. And it was he who was led as a lamb to the slaughter and rose as a lion who will rule and judge the earth. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Now he goes from Joel and he quotes their patriarch, King David, because he knows they're probably still not listening to him at this point. In Psalm 16, because you got to remember, they're looking for a leader who restores the land and the kingdom, not their soul. So he quotes Peter, or he quotes David. He says, I foresaw the Lord, this is Psalm 16, by the way, so I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad, moreover my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence." See, at this point in time, since they highly revered David, they couldn't dispute the words of their own king. And David himself is testifying that I am not this guy. Because by now, David is long dead. He is buried. His body is still in the grave. Thus, the words he is prophesying must be about somebody else. And his name is Jesus Christ, as Peter is pointing out, because it is, Jeter, or it is Jesus who sits at the right hand of God. It is Jesus who is the descendant of David's kingly line based off of God's promise in the Davidic covenants. It is Jesus alone whose body did not see decay in the grave. It is Jesus who was resurrected from the grave. It is Jesus who was witnessed by over 500 people from his resurrection by their own eyes. It was Jesus who is the only one who has ascended into heaven. And in verse 36, if you pop over to verse 36, he says, It is Jesus who is both Lord and Christ. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy that David gave to you. He did not make any any special considerations for the people who were there about how their feelings might be hurt by hearing the truth of God. He wanted them to know Lord and Savior. See, the people responded. In verse 37, listen to this. He says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and the brethren, what shall we do? See, the people responded because they were convicted by the gospel. They were convicted by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit working upon their heart. They were cut to the hearts. If you think back in different parts of your life when God was talking to you, there are moments where the Lord just pretty much fillets you wide open. And he says, now is the time for you to respond to me. Now is the time that you submit to my will. Now is the time that you call out that you may be restored to the Father. Now is the time for forgiveness and healing. That is what the Word of God does. That is exactly what people need now. They don't need more superficial love. Let me tell you what superficial love does. It presents the idea that you're accepted, and because you're accepted by somebody, now that's taken as love. That's false love. This is what it does. It allows someone to continue in their sin. It allows someone to walk down a path that is eternally harmful for them. It is not love. Nor sharing the, or, or not sharing the gospel with them because they might get offended is not love. We need to try to stop defining love as the world defines love and share what it truly is as God defines love and how this is how he defines love. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his life, his resurrection. 
Here's what his response was in verse 38. Peter says to them in his question of what shall we do? Repent. Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Simply put, they just needed to repent. They needed to be baptized because that's what God commanded in Matthew 28. They needed to be saved from this perverse generation by the blood of Jesus Christ, which is verse 40. When he says in many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Has the mission changed from Acts chapter 2 until 2022? The answer is no. We are giving people the gospel. We are sharing people the gospel so they may be saved from a perverse generation and it's getting more perverse as we go. These words become more and more true around us. See, for this is the gift of God. It is simply the gift of God. It is given by Jesus until the Lord calls his church home. From generation to generation to generation, you have the gift available to you. The freedom that is in Jesus Christ. What happens when people respond to the gospel? In this context, in this context, in verse 41, it says, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Can you just imagine if 3,000 people wanted to be in this little building? I don't think you'd be sitting in the same seat that you normally sit in. That's, but just imagine if we were so impassioned with the gospel that people became confronted, conflicted, and therefore repentant. And wherever God takes them for his gospel preaching message, we would be happy and joyous. See, people got saved and the church grew. The church does not grow without people getting saved. That is not a genuine church. So this is how they did it. They responded to the apostles' doctrine. What is the apostles' doctrine? The preaching and teaching of the word of God. The life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Once they came to that repentant knowledge, they joined together in fellowship with fellow believers. They shared in communion together. And what is that last one? They were taught the importance of prayer and praying together, and they delighted in it. They helped one another grow. They were concerned for one another we're gathered here to do the exact same thing. The exact same thing, for the gospel message has never changed and it is just as important for each and every one of us. We gather to hear about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And his return, by the way. I'm going to add the return to keep that hope of what we are fighting for. To be in fellowship with one another. To remember and be dedicated to God through the breaking of bread. To pray together for like-mindedness. For God's will to be done in our lives. To be witnesses for his gospel. For the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the salvation of souls, whether they are in this building or whoever you run into. And the simple aspect in that final, aspect, or the final words of 42 when he says, And they prayed together. Prayer matters. You need to believe this. Prayer matters. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Now maybe you say, well, he didn't give me the election the way he wanted it to. Maybe that's not the way God wanted it to work. Why is that? Because people are not broken. It's my viewpoint. People are not broken yet. Why are they not broken yet? Because they haven't come to terms with the gospel. They need to love the gospel. See, the gospel and prayer cannot be separated because prayer is all about the gospel. The two do not go in two different areas. They go together. Gospel, prayer, they are together. We pray for the gospel to work. God's word is going to work. We pray for the boldness to be able to speak the gospel 
We pray for God to water and grow those seeds for them to root deep within an individual. Prayer matters. We need to be a praying people. That's how the church began. With the gospel of Jesus Christ and prayer. It's how the church continues. And by the way, it is how the church will end when Jesus comes and takes us into heaven, into rapture. And therefore, we will continue to be praying people for all eternity. I just want to give you a final, a final couple of verses to encourage you <clears throat> this morning. From 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me as prisoner, this is Paul writing, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Do not be ashamed of our Lord God. I do not know what is going to be in store for his church other than what God has already written. There's going to be some life of problems. There's going to be some sufferings for the gospel's sake. There's going to be most likely uh, more underground churches as we go. But I will tell you this. The gospel wins 100% of the time. And throughout biblical history, the more opposition according or the more opposition of Jesus Christ, the gospel wins more and more people if we are faithful to give the message. I encourage you to remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a child of the light. You are not bound to the grave. You are not bound to sin. But you are given an inheritance of eternal life forever. And it is all because God called you with a holy calling even before time began. Even before you were born, God called you. We have a great God. We have a mighty God. Let's lift our voices together in prayer as a body. Because we simply just love our God because we want the gospel to reach people that have never been met. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you for the words and the example of the early church. In the previous chapters, we read about the hardships, we read about the struggles with the disciples of speaking too fast and not following when they should or falling asleep instead of staying awake or there are many of the mistakes that are listed for us, and in the end, we see the grace abounding much more than sin when Jesus fulfilling his mission by God choosing to send his son and Jesus walking to the cross. Father, may we remember the cost it took to pay the penalty for our sin. Father, may we remember the gift of the Holy Spirit that came out of your promise. Father, we praise you for the third, third piece of the Godhead who works in our heart, in our mind, who leads us in the path of righteousness, who reveals your word, your written and spoken word, who convicts our conscience, who cuts us to the heart. Father, you have given us every single thing that we need to be free from sin, to live in righteousness, to glorify you. Father, may we be a faithful child who seeks to be held in their father's arms, who seeks to proclaim the goodness of my dad is greater than everybody else. And it is all because of the gospel. 
May the gospel be alive of our tongue in our life. Father, may you be glorified. May more people come to hear the words, the unashamed preaching and teaching of the word of God by everybody here, wherever you take them. May they be convicted and call out upon Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you. We thank you. May we learn from Peter's example of how to proclaim the gospel passionately and boldly. We love you, Father. We thank you, Father, for counting us righteous, for making us worthy all through the blood of Jesus. We pray all this in the name of our love, beloved, holy, our Savior, our Lord, our King, our intercessor. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we thank you for worshiping with us today. We have some fellowship time out back with some coffee and some snacks. And for those of you who are taking off, winter's here in case you forgot. (laughs) 